Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 38, A Marvelous Proposal. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and I will read the script here. My totally awesome <laughs> and wonderful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Wow, you did that so well. That is a script that I did not actually write <laughs> myself, just for the record. Um, so, how are you doing today, sweetheart? I am doing wonderful. How are you, my love? I'd be doing great if I had put my monitors up and I didn't beforehand. So. Slacker. Yeah, we're all okay. that prep work and everything. I, you know what? Not everyone's perfect, <laughs> but there's then always, there's me, and there's always room for improvement. <laughs> always is. So we've got a we've got a good show lined up today. But before we get into that, I did have a rant that I had to get on. And I'm, I'm just gonna even, sit back and let him go. I'm not even gonna include this in the Disney Detective segment, so we'll we'll talk about it anyway. So last week we did um, our typical. Disney detective segment where we talked about various Disney news. And one of the articles that we talked about was a, um, movie preview. Actually, I believe the movie preview was part of the regular entertainment. I don't think was we it? did it as part of the Disney. I don't think it really Disney. matters though. In anyway, this case. I'll let you, you were just going to sit back, right? Let uh -oh. me do this. Okay. I'm sitting back. So, um, the preview that we had shown without sound, which we had commented over, was for the Jungle Cruise. Um, and, you know, we did our post-production uh, edits and got all the finalized video and audio done and everything. And we posted it up to uh, YouTube and promptly received a takedown notice or a block notice that we were posting copyrighted material. And this came from Disney Enterprises. And it was because we showed video of their movie trailer, which, so for the record, this podcast, we don't monetize this podcast. We don't make any money off of this. This is not a for-profit operation. This is purely for the love of entertainment and for you know, the sake of our viewers to keep them entertained and informed. So if you want to give us money, well, well, okay, okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm so, kidding. <clears throat> so Disney gave us a takedown notice on this, which it seems kind of strange because it's a movie preview, right? So it's material that they've produced themselves. They've released to the public themselves and it's material that its sole purpose is to generate revenue for Disney. Right. We're helping to promote this new movie. Exactly. So <clears throat> it, at what point in time would you not want to have that distribution? I mean, granted, we don't have a huge you know, following. We've got uh, on our Twitch channel right now, we've got less than 200 followers on our Twitch channel. So we're not, it's not hugely impactful. Right. But it's not detrimental mm -hmm. either. At no point in time could it be detrimental to have your movie preview that's an advertisement run somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yet we wound up getting this block notice uh, globally. It wasn't even nationwide. It was across the entire market spectrum of YouTube. And it forced me to go back in, re-edit the video, take the video out and keep the audio in and put a little editorial in. For, uh, you know, why we had to cut the video out of there. And uh, I just wanted to express my disappointment at Disney for having the, the lack of foresight to allow something like that to happen on a small podcast like this where it's not 
damaging to the company and ultimately beneficial to the company. And I just wanted to point out, this is typical of Disney's strong arm tactics of stepping on the little people, you know, not understanding the context in which, because it was an automated system that caught it. Um, and it clearly shows Disney lacks the, uh, the insight, well, you know, to, to coin our own phrase, they lack the insight into how the, the material is being used to objectively regulate their own advertising. And it wasn't even like it was like the full movie, because there are people that post full length movies or full episodes of television shows on YouTube. Well, that... in, in fact, it wasn't <coughs> even the full trailer. Right. And that it was literally only a portion of the trailer. Right. And that and that's kind of like, OK, if you're just doing a trailer, something that's a commercial, something that, you know, you're putting out there to to draw people to come in. Why would you right. block that from anybody using it? Right. So we are disputing it under uh, fair use copyright, fair, fair use copyright uh, laws. Um, we think we were well within our right because we were adding context to the material. We were not altering their material in any way. We were omitting portions of it so that it wasn't used in its entirety. Um, and we'll see where it goes. Okay. But from henceforth, we will not be showing any Disney trailers. We will not be giving Disney any uh, free advertising. Um, you know, we will report on the stories as they are uh, reported in the media. We will comment on it. Uh, and you will probably see a lot more of me de bashing Disney moving forward from here on out. Not that I didn't really hold back before. Really? Um, but, you know, I, I, I will now go out of my way to find the stories that reflect the negativity of Disney rather than the positive aspects of Disney. Because I think there's a pretty good balance of it out there. So, anyway, rant over. Uh, are we uh, ready to get into our Disney detective? Sure. Let's see how we can bash Disney now. <laughs> Go for Disney detective. I hate to tell you, but there's no bashing today. I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, so the first story we're going to talk about is if you've ever dreamed about putting on armor and fighting alongside the Avengers, your day has come as long as you have like $40. Um, so Avengers Damage Control is the latest virtual reality experience that the Void locations will be offering. Um, if you've ever uh, gone down to uh, Disney or in... Uh, Disney World or Disneyland uh, in uh, Disney Springs area, they have this virtual reality, um, uh, I don't want to say store, it's not a store. Well, it's, it's like a gaming Yeah, a gaming experience. experience, that's what it is, called The Void. Uh, previously, they've done um, a Star Wars experience that was Star Wars Secrets of the Empire. They had uh, Ralph Breaks the uh, VR, which was based off of Wreck-It Ralph. And now they have Damage Control, um, which is uh, from what they were saying that this one will actually run uh, between 18 and 20 minutes, um, which most of the other previous uh, virtual reality experiences were... Um, usually shorter time frame. So this is their longest one. Uh, so the, the, the telling of the story, um, basically you're introduced to Black Panther's sister who is devising a new suit based off of her brother's uniform and then Iron Man's tech from Stark Industries. And you're basically going through and, and fighting a bunch of people. But what's kind of cool is they also have... Um, different effects where like you feel wind and heat and a smell. Uh, somebody had said that, you know, you get a whiff of popcorn as an example, uh, as one point, um, you know, through, through the experience. Um, the video will actually feature several actors, uh, from the Marvel universe, um, and also some of their voices as well. Cause I guess some of it, um, yeah, I was kind of impressed that they were able to pull in, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. And Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd yeah. Yeah. So that, that was kind of cool. Um, while it's, you know, it remains, you know, expensive, 
in you know regards to if you just went to the movies, um, tickets cost about $40 um, for the experience. But again, that is for like a 20-minute experience. Right, right. So that's... And it, it's an intera- fully interactive experience, which right, is really cool. Right. Put you in a room with your gear on as a backpack and a helmet. And, right, right. You, know, so, you have to fight through it, and it's paced based on your playthrough. So right. you have to walk through the scenario and do all the different right, things in there. Right. So we've never done it because um, I think the last time we had been down in Disney, it hadn't opened yet because yeah. it's relatively new in Disney Springs. Um, but the void locations are, they obviously have it in Anaheim, which is, you know, the uh, Disneyland location where their Disney Springs area is, and then obviously in Orlando as well. Um, and it's suggested for kids 10 and up. I'm curious how, uh, how heavy the equipment is if you're strapping a backpack on so Clearly, the computing power is in the backpack with some yeah. battery power and the headset. So, some of the some of the current consumer grade VR stuff can get pretty heavy. Oh yeah, and uncomfortable to be. Yeah, just in. even putting you know like on your your face, not yeah. necessarily anything else. So, yeah. um, and it actually did open just yesterday, according to the article. Nice, cool. Next up. So, uh, Mediasitereview.org said that it is seeking the biggest, baddest Disney fans to watch 30 of their favorite Disney movies and TV shows on Disney Plus streaming service for the first 30 days after the platform launches, and you could make $1,000 for it. Um, candidates are expected to watch these movies and shows right down to the credits and then submit a review to, um, of the new streaming platform. Uh, applicants are required to list two of their top social media platforms and the number of followers that they have. I'm guessing with our, you know, 200 followers, we probably wouldn't. But don't I qualify as one of the <laughs> baddest Disney fans? Right. <laughs> you do, actually, <laughs> probably. Um, and you must be 18 years old. Uh, or older and a U.S. citizen. Uh, the application is actually available on review.org, which is a digital publication that offers reviews on technology devices and in-home services. Um, the applications are actually still being accepted uh, up until November 7th, um, and the publication is not being sponsored by Disney or any of their, their so companies. So we can actually talk about this without the threat of getting taken yes, down. Yes, exactly. So along with $1,000, five select Disney fanatics will get Get a one-year subscription to Disney Plus and a Disney-themed movie-watching kit, which includes a blanket, cups, popcorn popper, and popcorn kernels. Um, obviously, the launch of the streaming service is expected to be a major milestone for Disney. Um, as we've been talking about for a while now, you know, Disney Plus will be launching uh, later next month, and it's going to be the home of all things Disney. Um, you were even telling me, um, you know, one of my favorite, you know, Disney movies from when I was a kid, The Cat from Outer Space, is even going to be, you know, one of the movies available. So basically anything, you know, Disney has made, Pixar, Star Wars, Marvel, and, you know, all the new content as well will will be there. So that should be interesting. Thirty. It, that's 30 hours of streaming over 30 days, though, right? 30 movies. 30 movies. Over 30 days. Over 30 so days. So one movie a day. That's really not. Which isn't tough at all. I mean, because remember, they did a similar, there was, I don't know yeah, if this, it was something? the same kind of yeah. for Avengers. Right. So it was because stream it was all, all of these the movies, movies. In with, order or something, or in yeah, order with of the Yeah, with the exception timeline. of like the Hulk movies, because nobody, they were really, nobody yeah. requires you to watch Hulk movies. <laughs> Especially the, the the ones before. That you cutting, know? cutting dialogue, mm, Hulk smash. <laughs> it's, it's real deep. Um. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was similar to that, but that one was you had to do it over, like, a weekend. Right, right. It was, like, which is like 30 hours straight or something. Take your eyes open, you know, Don't ears nap. bleeding. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> No bathroom breaks. This was a little bit more forgiving. And, right. You know, a thousand bucks. You know? Yeah, not bad. Even I would watch Disney movies for a thousand bucks. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. That Maybe we'll have to put a... a a clip together or something. We, we might have. To. Yeah, because we do have. I some... think we should just do the application just to see. Just to see what it looks involved. like. Yeah, yeah, maybe we'll do that. We'll let you know if we do it. Yeah. Um, and we have the title article for today's show next. <laughs> 
All right, let's talk about so, that. So Brie Larson's reaction to this marriage proposal will make your day. You actually found uh, this article on, on BuzzFeed. And for our, our listeners who aren't viewing this, you have to go to BuzzFeed and, and look up this article because the photos... I don't know if we're going to be able to to do it justice because uh, it's really a, a visual thing. Um, so at the Ace Comic Con in Chicago, there were pictures that were taken when two fans met uh, Brie Larson during a, a photo uh, shoot. Um, so the two men are John and Richard, and John told BuzzFeed that he had handed a letter to Brie that explained why it was so special for him to propose in front of her. Um, and the pictures, again, if you're watching, uh, our YouTube or our live stream, you can see, you know, just her reaction is, is just awesome how, you know, she was like, oh my God, you know, um, you know, and, and crying and everything. Uh, he also shared that he and Richard have been overwhelmed by the response. Uh, what a special moment for my husband and me to be with our favorite hero is being embraced by the world, and it just feels so amazing. Uh, it was clearly so special to Brie with her expression that's basically like, oh my god, this is really happening! Uh, and even after the couple kissed, she kind of peeked out from behind them, still completely, you know, in shock that, you know... She was there for this. Um, and afterwards, she actually tweeted and gave her love to the newly engaged couple. So just a really sweet, you know. You know, as, as much as I am often down on Disney, I do try to find, you know, the feel-good stories mm -hmm. once in a while. And when I saw this one, this one was just, it was too cute just to see her reaction. Mm -hmm. um, but not just the visual reaction. The, the response that she had about how this was a, a life-changing experience for mm -hmm. her to see it, um, it was cute. It was mm -hmm. cute, and I have to imagine, considering the, the number of likes and retweets and mm -hmm. right. the response that it had, it had an impact on other people, too. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was nice that she was such a good sport about mm -hmm. it, that she agreed to you know participate in it, and, and you know, I think it, it had a lasting impact effect on a lot of people so kudos to uh brie for for taking her there's a shot of her yeah there's the shot of her peeking out going oh my god that's so cute so yeah. i thought that was a that was a great story to end our disney detective on this week mm -hmm. kind of offsets my rant a little bit but uh <laughs> you know i'm not gonna be bitter about that no never so that is it for disney detective this week we have some entertainment news coming up next. So tell us about our entertainment news this week. So Martin Scorsese is doubled down on his beliefs that today's movies are still like amusement parks. So we had talked about it the other week with Samuel L. Jackson basically coming forward and defending, you know... The Marvel movies and, and everything because Martin Scorsese a couple you know weeks before had made comments about you know the Marvel movies and superhero movies in general and and kind of bashing them and now Martin has decided to come back you know, you know again because he, didn't, he, didn't he has nothing enough people off right the he first didn't time. he didn't upset everybody um, you know so basically he he came forward again and and said that Marvel movies are are just not cinema um, and so per the Hollywood Reporter you know his comments were made um, at the BFI London Film Fest where his latest movie a star-studded mafia film. <laughs> Oh, which seems geez, to be Scorsese making a mafia film that <laughs> right, never happens. Right. And he, you know, he repeated his beliefs that comic book movies, which have become one of the only genres that Hollywood studios still regularly crank out, is destroying the mid-budget films made by the likes of Scorsese himself are a plague. Um, it's not cinema, it's something else, Scorsese said. We shouldn't be invaded by it. 
We need cinemas to step up and show films that are narrative films. Um, basically, he had compared, you know, the Marvel and DC films to theme parks. Um, and then he doubled down on that, saying that theaters have become amusement parks and they're all fine and good, but don't, in, you know, don't invade everything else in that sense. Um, he did offer an, al- an olive branch saying um, that implied that he'd been listening to some other people, such as Guardian of the Galaxy's Maven uh, James Gunn, who tried to clap back at him, but with respect, saying they're uh, they're fine and good for those who enjoy that type of film. By the way, knowing that uh, what goes into them, I admire them for what they're do. It's just not my thing. It simply is not. It's creating another kind of audience that thinks cinema is that. Right, because you know we need to get rid of these feel good superhero shows that show us how the underdogs can win and you know fight for what you believe in. Right, and replace it with more of the mafia glorified <laughs> cutthroat criminal movies because that's right. much more wholesome. Right, right. right. Um, but what was kind of funny is Scorsese's controversial statements about superhero movies is kind of funny because while the number one movie in the in the world right now is Joker, which is a gritty standalone origins film that's you know heavily embedded in two of the director's most beloved films, it's kind of like Taxi Driver, also like a little bit like Kings of Comedy. And actually features Robert De Niro in a key supporting role, who is obviously in almost every Every Scorsese Scorsese film. So it was kind of like, oh, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) you know, you know, this is this is a case (laughs) just like with Spielberg standing up and and complaining and moaning about Netflix, you know, Mm -hmm. and and streaming services being uh, nominated for Academy Awards. Right. This is a clear-cut case of old Hollywood being threatened by, by the what, new. what is new. Mm-hmm. No, I and, see that. You know, for it would be smart to be less critical of what's new and be more supportive and embrace it mm-hmm. and accept what's new because the times change. Guess what, Martin Scorsese? We don't do silent films anymore either, okay? <laughs> I hate to break it to you. Oh, and the majority of our films, they happen to be in color now, too. <laughs> I was just going to say that. Darn, so, you beat me to it. You know, the industry changes, and if mm-hmm. you don't change with it, you're going to be left you're gonna behind. You're going to be left behind. You're going to yeah. be Charlie Chaplin, left behind in the silent black and white film. Oh, movies. and wait a second. Your movie came out in certain theaters, but you're streaming it on Netflix. Right. Hmm. Right. So you you're not you're yeah. you're kind of let's be less yeah. hypocritical and a little right. bit more open minded. Yeah. It's there's <clears throat> absolutely nothing wrong with superhero films yeah. now that they can make them. You right. Know, I mean, we were stuck with some some real stinkers for exactly. a while there. Mm-hmm. Now the technology has caught up to it that mm-hmm. they can do it. Right. And do it so well that right. you know, like Avengers Endgame was not. But it was not wrapped in special effects. It wasn't Mm-mm. the special effects wasn't what people went for. It was the story. The story, absolutely. And it was, to his point, the narrative. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that you can take, I don't know, what was it, twenty three films over the course of ten years, twenty three individual films with different characters, different lead characters, build them up over the course of ten years, and then finalize it. And bring them all together in a single movie. Yeah, that in itself is a work of art. Mm-hmm. Scorsese's not even come close to that. Making the same mafia movie over and over right. again every time with the same actors. All they mm-hmm. do is change the color of their suits. Right. So and the cars. Right. Their cars. Right. Change. The cars get better. Right. But yeah. You know what? You need to go back to your origins and realize mm-hmm. that. The stuff that you do now is the same stuff that you were doing 30 and 40 years ago. You need to get with the times. Yep. So, good director, mm-hmm. but yeah. kind of pigeonholes himself, and, and this commentary that he has proves that point. Yep. So let's talk Star Wars. So J.J. Abrams said that Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, strives to give a cohesive ending to all nine movies. He said, endings are the things that scare me the most. Um, He said when... uh, Especially when they have to follow up that stinker (laughs) that Ryan Johnson put out. 
Right. And obviously he co-wrote uh, and will be directing this last one. Um, so after all, he has, you know, arguably never been uh, there's never been a film tasked with wrapping up more stories that span a longer cinematic period than Skywalker. Uh, the film not only finishes Abrams' Disney-produced trilogy that launched in 2015 with The Force Awakens, but obviously George Lucas's six previous episodes uh, that began in 1977 with A New Hope. So that's 42 years of blockbuster sci-fi adventures that somehow have to conclude in one movie. But not shut the genre down because right. Disney's not done milking it. Absolutely. Moo. <laughs> <laughs> We need, like, cow sound effects for that. Uh, this is about bringing this thing to a close in a way that is emotional and meaningful and also satisfying in terms of actually answering as many questions as possible. Um, he said that, so in years from now, someone watching these movies, all nine of them, they're watching a story that is co is as cohesive as possible. Um, he said while there were things that were planned for and discuss, George Lucas himself said that he created uh, this, that he actually saw it as three, three act plays. And it doesn't mean that there isn't discovery. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that, you know, come up and make you go, oh, here's another opportunity. Um, he said it also uh, doesn't mean that there's a list of uh, payoffs that we do because of the setups. Uh, we're, uh, but we're also very much aware of this and that the end of the trilogy, it also be, needs to be very satisfying. Uh, we went into this thinking, knowing that it has to have an ending and we're not going to screw around. So hopefully again, with everything that happened in last Jedi, they're, you know, fixing all of that and then just bringing, you know, uh, a good close to the whole story. Um, well, I get a kick out of the fact that he talks about, you know, what Lucas's original idea was. Mm -hmm. You can't really go down that path and talk about what Lucas's original idea was when Disney acquires right, the and entire franchises and basically throws everything that Lucas had out the window mm -hmm. and doesn't even want him involved because Lucas gave him a treatment for Force Awakens. Right. And they're like, eh, no thanks. We'll do it ourselves. Right. You know, and, and they did. And and Force Awakens was a, you know, one for the fans. Mm -hmm. And then you let Ryan Johnson come in and ruin and the entire it. franchise right. with, with that debacle of what he came out with. Right, right. So now I can certainly understand his apprehension to having to end the series itself because he has the weight of wrapping up nine movies over a 40-year time span. But that's overshadowed by having to clean up the mess that right. Ryan Johnson made. Right. So you're going to have to spend a large portion of the movie cleaning up all the stuff that he screwed up, then bringing an entire mm. saga to a close. Or if it's kind of like what, you know, happened with Last Jedi when, you know, Ray handed the lightsaber to, to Luke and he just went, right. you know, where all half of her journey was, you know, getting it to him. Maybe there's going to be that quick little fix or something. I, you know, maybe it won't be I so hope. long in the movie. But that, he screwed up so many things in that yeah, movie. Yeah, well, you, hopefully. You're going to have to take at least a third to a half of the movie fixing those things if yeah. you want to put this train back on well, the rails. Well, hopefully it'll, it'll happen. And like I said, you can't, you're not ending a franchise. Right. You're well, you're ending, ending the saga you're of ending Skywalker. A story line right, here, right. But you have to do it in such a way as mm -hmm. to open up the door to the stuff that's right. coming down the road. Right. Um, like, I don't expect them to set up the next series here, but you can't. You're dealing with things in the Star Wars universe that affect the entire universe. Mm -hmm. You look at stuff like The Mandalorian. Okay. So, The Mandalorian is a an offshoot. It's a tertiary story that the stuff that happened in the Mandalorian, assuming you don't go and kill a head of state as an assassin, mm -hmm. you, what you do doesn't affect the grand scheme of things. But when you're talking about, you know, in the, in the star Wars Skywalker saga, you're talking about things that are affecting the entire galactic structure. So like you can't end this and not change everything else. Mm. And the closest parallel that I have to this is 
when they tried to get um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to sort of follow the storyline of Avengers. Okay. Okay. So you would see when Avengers came out, there was some spillover into right. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And then you had you got to the point where S.H.I.E.L.D. falls. Mm-hmm. Well, that has a dramatic impact, but you didn't have S.H.I.E.L.D. like feeding back into Avengers. Mm-hmm. And it, this is one of those things where if you end the universe, <laughs> you know. In <laughs> Everything the, else will fall. Right, exactly. Right. So it's like you have to kind of have that that, mm-hmm. that uh, animosity moving forward. You have to have those plot twists going forward. And mm-hmm. if, you, if you resolve everything, you know, you kind of ruin the rest of the franchise. Unless no, everything that you do is going to, you're going to keep going back and doing origin movies. Right. Because we saw how well that went with Solo, right? I want to be a pilot. I'm a pilot. <laughs> I want to look like I want to look like Solo. <laughs> that was probably our favorite our, our favorite uh, meme. Because <laughs> it was like every other line that I was. I want to be a pilot. I'm a pilot. I want to be a pilot. I'm best pilot. <laughs> uh, anyway, please, JJ, save the franchise. That's all I have to say on this one. <laughs> and if you don't already know, Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker opens December twentieth. All right, that is all we had for our insightful picks. No. Uh, no, that was not. That was all we had for entertainment news. We're going to move on to our insightful picks. And to you, my dear. So I'm going with something kind of different, but something, you know, uh, away from the television, movie, entertainment, uh, more an entertainment to to go and enjoy with your family. Um, One of the fall festivities that that we like to do uh, every year or so or every other year is a local farm uh, called Shady Brook Farms that, uh, that is located in Yardley, Pennsylvania. So not too far away from us, not too far away from the Philadelphia area if you're you're in the surrounding area um and they do different seasonal activities um during the christmas holiday season they have a drive-through uh light exhibit that you can go through um there's uh fruit picking throughout you know the summer seasons and then during the fall they have a fall fest uh fall fest includes apple uh fest um and pumpkin fest um and then there's app- they do a lot of fest they do <laughs> it's kind of like a fest and then they actually do their scary horror fest which is done at night um so what fall fest is is you pay a, a flat fee uh, to enter, and they have various different attractions and things to do. So they have wagon rides that will take you out to the apple orchards and the pumpkin patch. Um, and the apples, it depends on what time of the season they there are. We actually happened to go last weekend, and there were still a, a bunch of apples, but I know we've gone other years where it was kind of later in, in the season and the apples weren't around, but there's always pumpkins uh, available. Um, then they have a little playground area. They also have these giant jumping pillows for for the kids to jump on. They also, yeah, not a bounce house. They're literally right, pillows that are in the giant, ground pillow that um but they do have bounce houses for the the smaller kids uh they have a sports challenge area uh a corn maze which this year you actually joined us and 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 cheated and cheated but we (laughs) we lasted a lot longer in the corn maze this time than (laughs) than before um then they what they do uh which is kind of nice is during the day they have two of their quote-unquote horror attractions that they um, do for kids so basically you're still walking through the the haunted house but the lights are on and none but of no one's home basically <laughs> there's no actors to to scare you it's just the gory props that are there but nothing's moving or, or anything they do whisper sometimes yes that was kind of freaky the one area is like hello are you there what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah, that 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 was kind of freaky. Hello. Um, <laughs> is it me you're looking for? <laughs> so they have two of them uh, set up during the day. They have the the barn house 
uh, of Terror Junior, and then they also have an Alien Invasion of Junior. Uh, so which again, three D, which by is three D. It is kind of cool. So even though the lights are are still kind of on, it is you know kind of freaky. Um, but then at night they do have two other attractions. Except for that point, you're walking into the wall. Yeah, I did. Make a left at the end of the really dark hall. That was kind of funny. Um, but at night, again, they do... Uh, it comes to life. It comes to life. They have two other attractions uh, that are, are available. Um, they have a little go-kart section. They have barnyard animals. Um, they have a uh, hail bay obstacle course. They do pig racing. They do pig racing. Um, they do have a, a nice little obstacle course now that's set up, but you have to be 52 inches or under. And unfortunately, our daughter is taller than that, so she was a little bummed yeah. uh, that she she wasn't able to do that. You could shoot paintballs. I was going to say then for an extra fee. So basically, it's it's one cost to to get in for all of that, but then they do have extra things. So they have paintball guns. Uh, what was it? Tomato cannon. Tomato cannons. Uh, monster that, trucks. They have monster trucks. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> they do pony rides. They do have food. Uh, there are refreshments of of all kinds. Even the adult beverage kind um and there's live music on the weekend they usually have that's you the know, kind of drinks with the little umbrellas right yeah. makes the parents very happy right. um apple cider donuts uh kettle corn you know your traditional the best damn kettle corn no best darn oh is it corn. darn yeah oh, it was darn it. Oh. yeah it was darn. Okay. <laughs> so you can definitely you know and it's funny because we always say like when we leave the parking lot, the parking lot is so incredibly full, but because it's spread out over such a large area, you never feel like you're on top of anybody. Right. You know, now we've never gone for the horror side of it, so I don't know, you know, how long the lines are for, for other things. You know, the biggest line that we had was waiting for the wagon to go do the apple picking and the pumpkin patch picking, but it really wasn't that long but right. as we were leaving we did notice that the line did get a little bit longer for but that they run that round trip all day long right it's, not it's a constant thing um you know i think they stop running the wagons at five o'clock basically once yeah. it gets dark um same thing with the 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 two haunted houses the kids version they shut it down at five o'clock because they need to get it ready for you know the evening they pile all the zombies in right right yeah. but once you're in you're in so if you want it you know if you especially if you go on the weekend if you wanted to stay you know because at night they start doing like bonfires so you and, get there at like three you can do the kid-friendly version right and, and then around. stick around for for the adult one so cool good pick we had a good time there mm -hmm. thank you thank you So I'm going to dig out a golden oldie for my pick this week. This actually happened to be one that I stumbled across on Netflix. It's a series. Uh, it's a six-part series that was produced for PBS. It was actually one of the most popular PBS shows uh, of all time from what I've read. And it is Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth. And, and if you don't know who Joseph Campbell is, uh, Joseph Campbell... Um, was an American professor of literature at Sarah Lawrence uh, College who worked in comparative mythology and comparative religion. Uh, his most well-known book is The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was uh, published in 1949, in which he discusses his theory of the journey of the archetypical hero shared by world mythologies, which he termed the monomyth. Now, the reason that that's significant is that Joseph Campbell has had a huge influence on a number of authors and movie producers and story writers, one of which happens to be George Lucas. Oh, okay. Uh, George Lucas attributed much of Campbell's work to influencing him in the Star Wars saga. Okay. Um, Luke Skywalker epitomizes the, the hero archety archetype that Joseph Campbell um, defines. And, and Joseph Campbell's definition of this hero archetype is one that spans across literature for thousands of years. Okay. From, you know, Greek mythology to Indian mythology, 
to various cultures. Um, so Joseph Campbell was um, very well known in the literature circles and fictional writing circles. And this series itself um, was a series of interviews that he did over a course of a couple of weeks with uh, journalist Bill Moyer. And it was published shortly after his death. Joseph Campbell passed away in, in October of 1987. Okay. Um, and it's done almost like a series of um, uh, college lectures. Okay. Where Moyer poses questions to him based on his works, and you get a very deep and um, detailed understanding of the historical and cultural background on myth and the various – each episode goes into a different aspect of storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had never read Joseph Campbell. I was aware of him based on the influence he had on Lucas. And in watching this series, you really understand – the impact and he even Lucas even makes an appearance in the series at one point in time oh, okay. talking about the influence uh, because he had actually met and, and knew Joseph Campbell, but the series itself, it's not, it's a documentary, but it's not a typical Ken Burns style documentary. It's a, like I said, lecture series basically. So if it's, if, if you are interested in fictional writing, if you're interested in mythology, um, this is really something that you probably want to spend a couple hours and and sit down and watch because it's incredibly educational Mm -hmm. and incredibly insightful and it really makes you understand where the minds of people like George Lucas and other storytellers are when it comes to how they make come up with their stories and come up with Mm. their ideas and how they flow the stories. And, you know, we talked during the uh, entertainment segment about J.J. Uh, Abrams mm-hmm. and how Lucas had envisioned, you know, three three part uh, trilogies. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a formula that comes out of the work that Joseph Campbell mm-hmm. had, you know, and this is work that, and his, he's, these aren't his original ideas. Right. Um, it was basically Joseph Campbell going back and looking at literary history, even in Shakespearean mm-hmm. uh, plays, and seeing this recurring pattern over and over. And it was a pattern that came out of different cultures that didn't really have contact with each other. So there was a common baseline of how these stories came about and and how the human mind thinks. And there is a very deep psychological um, angle to the entire thing. And and at the end of the series, you kind of see how he, he sums everything up. And things tend to make a lot more sense. You know, why things are done, what order they're done in, what the motivations of characters are. So if you're someone who's interested in in creative writing, mm-hmm. I think this is an absolute must-watch Um because it really it, it teaches you how to tell a story. Hmm. And it's a story that's been told, a formula for stories that's been told for thousands of years of human history. Um, fascinating uh, man to, uh, to listen to and uh, just a great, great learning experience for me. Hmm. Good so, pick. Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth, uh, streaming on Netflix now. And I think that was uh, all that we had this week. Dear, do we have any afterthoughts? I don't think so. No? All right. Well, I think that will do it for us this week. Don't mm-hmm. forget to reach out to us. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can get us on Twitter. At insights underscore things. In YouTube, we're at uh, www.youtube.com slash insightsintothings. On our no website. At www.insightsintothings.com. You can get our audio podcast at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com uh, or on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. And I think that's it. 
Another one in the books. Another one done. We're out of here. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.